Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is the Other People Podcast. I'm Brad Listy. I am your host. I'm in Los Angeles. It's Friday. So it's time for a flashback episode where I dig into the other people archives and share an outtake from an episode out of the past. Today, we're going to be flashing back to episode 559, my conversation with poet, artist, and television writer Tommy Pico. Episode 559 first aired on January 9th, 2019. Tommy Pico is the author of the books IRL, Nature Poem, Junk, and Feed. And he has written on the television shows Reservation Dogs, Resident Alien, and Crystal Lake. Originally from the Viejas Indian Reservation of the Kumeye Nation, he now lives in Los Angeles where he makes abstract portraits with various kinds of wax, acrylics, watercolors, food coloring, and India ink. You'll be hearing a flashback to episode 559, my conversation with Tommy Pico, momentarily. A reminder before we get going that I do a weekly email newsletter. You can sign up for free over at bradlisty.substack.com. There is also another people Patreon community. I would love it if you would join over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Help keep this show going into the future. If you would like to join the other people book club, you can do that at the show's official website, other PPL.com. You can also get other people apparel, t-shirts, sweatshirts, and whatnot at other PPL.com. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the Other People Show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. All right, so here we go with today's flashback. This outtake, once again, comes from episode 559, which first aired on January 9th, 2019, my conversation with author, artist, television writer, poet, Tommy Pico. A reminder that the full episode, episode 559, is available in the feed. So if you enjoy this flashback and you want to go in for the full conversation with Tommy Pico, just look for episode 559 wherever you get your podcasts. It is there in its entirety, as are all episodes of this program. So... I think we're ready. I think that does it with the preliminaries. Let's get to this week's flashback. Here I am in conversation back in 2019 with Tommy Pico. I heard this quote, I think it was from Sarah Paulson, and maybe she was talking about somebody else, but she was like, I don't get paid to act. Um, I would do the acting for free, but I get paid because I miss birthday parties i miss you know uh weddings i miss best friend birthday like stuff like that and i feel the same way like i would perform for free but it's like like i miss a lot and you know i don't have like a romantic life it's hard to get traction with anybody when you're on the road all the time and it's kind of like the theme or like the subject of my fourth book the one that's coming out in the fall which Which is, is like which is called what feed out from tin house fall 2019 and it's a lot of it is about being a traveling performer and perpetually traveling and the excitement of that, but then also the loneliness of it. There's like that adrenaline rush. You do the performance and then you're back in some weird hotel, right? Yeah. And I'm just kind of like sitting there in, in a bathrobe sometimes with a glass of vino verde feeling a little bit like, oh, I've made it. And also feeling like I wish my friends were here. <laughs> I mean, I talk to a, like a lot of a lot of my friends are stand ups and they have very similar relationships because, you know, their life is also a lot of time subsidized by universities and comedy clubs and they'll be in um weird comedy condos or in like you know motels like whatever um and that it's so hard to know what to do with the adrenaline afterwards i understand why people like get would just get fucked up or you know get drunk or whatever because it the experience of being on stage in front of so many people and interacting with them and like uh the the kind of the kind of like uh, 
mental acrobatics and physical acrobatics that you have to do in order to, for me anyway, in order to get to that point of being up in front of people, because I'm just very naturally shy. <laughs> um, but in order to do Are that, you really? And, yeah, absolutely. But in order to do that and then to enjoy it um, and to give the audience a show, then it, it's it used to be a lot harder for me to put the, put it on, put that performance energy on. And now it's just much harder for me to take it off. Like, I don't know what to do with myself afterwards. Like, I'll get off stage and I'll be like shaking and not be able to talk to anybody and then i'll like be laying in bed later like unable to go to sleep and i'm like dang what is going i need there must be an easier way of doing this is it you like that's the thing like because i feel like <clears throat> i've talked to some writers who in a very like normal way i feel like normal writerly way are shy introverted but then get these invitations to read or perform and discover that they do have this performative aspect to themselves and i guess the question is like Part of it's like, well, you're being invited mm -hmm. and there are people showing up mm -hmm. and they're expecting some kind of performance. And they could literally be anywhere else, but they chose to be there with me in that room. So I want to give them something. So I guess the question then is like, how do you, if your natural inclination is towards shyness and introversion, how do you create a performative self that is authentic? Do you yeah. feel it's authentic? I do. I, I mean, it's authentic to itself in the sense that when I first started out, I remember like I... I, I would get like I would shake and I would turn red and I would like sweat profusely. I was unable to just do do it as me um, because in in a way it's like very exposing. And so if I got on stage and I thought I was doing it as me, Tommy Pico, I don't know that I would be able to go through with it because I would feel like people were seeing me. But if I get up there, my voice goes up a little bit and I'm like, ah, hi, it's Tommy T. Like I call that person Teebs. That's like my alter ego. He's the one that I write my books. The perspective of the books is from him. Um, I mean, and we're very similar in the sense that we inhabit the same body and we ha exhibit the same characteristics, but his inclination is towards um, uh, confrontation, right? Whereas mine is a little bit to go inward a little bit more. So, so you have like an alter ego. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I was, you know, it's interesting. I've heard you say in other interviews or I've read in other interviews where you like, I, I kind of have to trick myself into writing poetry. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're tricking yourself into performing. Absolutely. So it's like you, you create these circumstances or you, what do you, what do you tell yourself? You tell yourself that you're Teebs? I in the beginning, I think more so I had to just like pump myself up. It was more of like a ritual or a routine or I had to like get into like some kind of headspace. Now, I don't know how to explain it other than... I am myself until the moment the curtain comes up or whatever, metaphorically. And I could just, it, in a snap, I feel, I feel it like, like some kind of, some kind of string from the top of my head just pulls me upward. And all of a sudden, like I'm him, you know? And you can do it. And what's like, what are the key differences? Like, well, I guess Teebs is like extroverted. Yeah. I, I guess I, I have a tendency to, um, to second guess myself in general. I think probably a lot of people, if not everyone does. And sometimes that, the the inclination to second guess myself leads me to a place of complete and utter static and inaction because I don't know like do I dare to eat a peach you know what I mean um but Teebs is like he he has no he doesn't second guess anything but also he talks so fast that if he misspeaks he can like just keep going on from there so in a way it's like a a kind of of uh, unfurling of a kind of 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 energy that I kind of keep locked down deep inside of me that I don't let out that often. Well, and it's like people coming to see a performance don't want to watch somebody be indecisive on stage. No, they don't no, want to no, watch no. somebody like quibble with themselves. Yeah. Or constantly apologize or whatever. But then it's weird because a lot of the friends that I have now, uh, it, w through the podcast that I have food for thought, um, or who I've met since publishing books, they don't necessarily know that that is a new that's an in intervention like a new innovation of my personality like i used to like for the majority of my 20s i was so shy and like i could not get on stage and i realized that the difference between selling you know a uh, hundred books or selling a hundred thousand books was me getting on stage and selling it so i had to like kind of do a boot camp with myself you know i i did a lot of like i started going to um what do you call it uh, a singing teacher and i would do vocal exercises and just to be able to project i could not project to the back of a room um i had a mentor named pamela sneed she's a poet and an uh, actress and uh, activist and a bunch of other stuff and she really taught me a lot of 
uh, performance um, basics. And uh, I, I also took an improv class just because I heard that it would it was good for like loosening up that static, you know. And then the, their tagline it was at UCB, and their tagline was like "Think at the top of your intelligence" or something like that. And that taught me how to be decisive in the moment. Um, and and also just getting on stage as often as I possibly could. I created a reading series so that I could get on stage every other month. So you really like systematically <laughs> attacked this. Mm -hmm. And you also had like this insight that you're not going to sell books unless you, as a poet, that makes sense. You've got to get up in front of people. I think if people see you in a um, engaging, possibly funny, entertaining way, mm -hmm. perform the work, they're more likely to connect with it. Yeah. And, and I thought that, I mean, I don't think that's the duty of the quote unquote poet, but it became my duty to myself and to potentially to, for people who would read my work. I mean, I think it's audacious to assume that you're going to have a reader anyway, but if you do have one and they do show up, I do want to give them something. I started a reading series in New York at the Ace Hotel with Morgan Parker called Poets with Attitude. And that was our main goal. It didn't matter what poetic style you had. It didn't matter what you were writing about or how old you were or whatever. It was more so like, do you give something to the crowd? And so we'd have um, poets come. We had like three every season. They would come to the Ace Hotel and we would just, it, they, they had to be people whose performance style we liked. I mean, and it didn't have to be like my style. It didn't have to be like Morgan's style either. I mean, we're more confrontational uh, readers, but it was like, if, if somebody had figured out their voice, you know what I mean? In, in performance, like those are the people we wanted to bring in and to display and put on stage. Do you, do you do crowd work? Um, not, I mean, more so when I'm doing a live show with the podcast with Food for Thought, that's more interactive crowd wise. I mean, they're the point of having a live podcast is so that you interact with the crowd a little bit more, right? Um, but I've learned how to um, to be um, to take cues from the crowd, right? Um, a lot of times, though, because what I'm reading, it's from long work. So there's not that break in between poems that like, like typical poets have. So it's like I'm going to be reading like for a stretch of 20 minutes without break, without a break in between it. Yeah, because you work long form. Poetry. Yeah, yeah, my exclusively in the long form. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy when I when I discovered what my thing was, like when I found my medium, you know, it was kind of like finding your medicine that worked, like some some routine or something that works for you. And I was like, that's why I've been been so restless and unsuccessful and looked over in all the other types of writing that I tried to do before because I was I was trying to fit my voice into a medium instead of bending a medium towards my voice you know right how did you how did you find it well I think again it was like a lot of small interventions that accumulated over time one of them was uh taking the improv class that led me to um, then I, I took a workshop with Ariana Rhines and it was called Ancient Evenings and, and the idea it was it was very much in the spirit of improv but the idea was like we would read some kind of ancient impenetrable text uh, then we would spend some time um, just kind of writing to ourselves and quietly listening to music for like five minutes then we wrote for ten minutes and then we shared what we wrote and it was kind of a, a the experience of having to write something in the moment and then share it terrified me but it terrified me into writing um clearly and also being adherent to the reading that we did before even if i didn't totally understand it i realized that whatever it brought out in me whatever i read in the text whatever it brought out in me i was already thinking those things you know that was in it that was my interpretation that's how you build a reading and then building a reading and understand what understanding what i was thinking then i was able to synthesize that into writing so that's why I, um w with long form i knew that I could write every day as long as I fed myself with something, as long as I fed myself with something challenging um, and paid attention to the thoughts that were louder than others. Then I could. So, so giving myself a daily writing practice via this ancient evenings thing was a part of it. So, so your daily writing practice involves first reading, mm -hmm. reading or watching something or, you know, uh, interacting with the world in a meaningful way. So whether that is deep reading a book or uh, taking myself to a film or uh, listening to music, but like not not putting it on in order to tune out, but putting it on in order to tune in. Because um, because, again, like then I just find myself having random opinions and then I turn that into writing. So that was a part of it. A part of it was kind of um, deciding to read longer work. 
Um, I had not done that before, probably the age of 29, because I was afraid of long work. I was afraid of my inability to pay attention to it. I mean, short poems are hard enough. When like, you say long work, you mean long poems. Long poems, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, book-length poems, primarily. Um, I thought that it was totally beyond my capabilities as a as a reader and as a human being to pay attention to anything for that long. But once I let um, let loose my inhibition um, and and really interacted with it, I found a new level of appreciation for poems because it was something that lived with me. You know, it grew with me. I took it around in my day, and my day became a part of the work, and I became a part of the work. And I found that experience so transcendent and unlike anything I'd ever felt before. And then I took a workshop with uh, Jason Koo through um, his outfit called Brooklyn Poets. And we were reading A.R. Ammons. And our challenge was to, was we were reading a, a section of Tate for the turn of the year, and our, our challenge was to write something sort of in that style or begin, just begin something longer. And, and again, it, I took my, the, the way I read with Ancient Evenings and sort of the way I performed with Pam and the way that I uh, 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 learned how to be ad, ad, adherent to my thoughts. And, and I, in, in the space of that 15-minute workshop, I wrote the first three pages of what became IRL, my first book. Hmm. Um, and then it was Beyonce's visual album coming out in 2013 on my birthday as I turned 30. <laughs> Literally the second it, December 13th hit, it was all over the place and it was a long poem and I it was a visual it was a visual poem and it was also a, a, a song of, ep- it was like an epic song cycle. Um, and I'm from the Kumeyaay Nation in Southern California and one of uh, the cornerstones of our traditional music is, are these things called are these things called the bird songs and they are epic song cycles. And so I started to understand that I was actually participating, not necessarily in long poems, but I was participating in bird songs in the making of bird songs. My dad is a bird singer. I grew up listening to them. They're embedded inside of me. And so I was able to kind of connect something ancient inside of me with something new in the world. And the the synthesis of those things became my books. That makes perfect sense. Like there's a, there's like a flawless logic to that. Um, it's almost, it's almost one of those things where you look in, like in, in hindsight, like how could I not have seen this? Yeah. I mean, the best thing that that did for me was it gave me a sense of purpose. I understood why I was here. And for an indigenous person, that's really key because I mean, suicide rates in, in, in Indian country are the highest anywhere in the world. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with not, under, not understanding one's purpose and innovating and making the first new bird songs in 150 years. I was like, that's, I'm here for a reason. I feel like um, any semblance of, of self-destructive behaviors I had kind of flew out of me with that understanding. I was like, no, I have to be here for a long time. I have to preserve this and I have to keep making this work in the world. That's awesome. Yeah, it feels good. So, okay. So you were raised on the reservation? Yeah. 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 From, I mean, the whole childhood. Mm-hmm. Un- until I left for college when I was 18. Um, but yeah, and my dad is a tribal chairman and my mother was like, did the choir. They were both in the like volunteer fire service. I mean, they were very community minded. Like I grew up understanding the benefit of and the value of community. And I think that's why wherever I go, um, community is very important to me. I mean, it's that, not that it's not important to other people, but it's like, I, I can't help but build community. I feel like it's, I understood the importance of having um, like, I don't know. I, w- I want to say something very basic, like like-minded social networks, but something a little bit that that, that there's that there's something sp- almost spiritually, uh, uh, spiritually satisfying about having a community in that way. I think it's no. I think it's essential, and I think it's it's a lost art, like creating community and understanding its value. I think people, most people feel a lot of people, especially. I don't know. I don't want to characterize it as like a predominantly urban thing, but it feels like so many people feel isolated or lonely or mm-hmm. detached from any sense of real community. That's certainly the case in Los Angeles based on conversations I have. So mm-hmm. I think people who have the gift of being able to create community are 
uh, very necessary. And, but it's like I, I started an art collective when I was in, in Brooklyn in like 2007. Um, I started like this podcast, Food for Thought, with some people, and 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 and, and in making like posts of attitude, the reading series, and in just like and, and, and in publishing and in reading, and I just kind of I've always been able to kind of accumulate people around me or around the nucleus of an idea, but not in any kind of um, almost self determined way. Just it just happens. Not it's not accidental, but it definitely doesn't feel like I'm doing it with that intention, but it just kind of happens to grow around me. Okay, folks, there we go. That is today's flashback, an outtake from episode 559, my conversation with Tommy Pico. Episode 559 first aired on January 9th, 2019. A reminder that the full episode, episode 559, is available in the feed if you want to hear the full hour with Tommy. Just look for episode 559 wherever you get your podcasts. A reminder that all episodes of The Other People Show are available wherever podcasts are available. For more on Tommy Pico, visit tommy-pico.com. His visual art can be seen on Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to The Other People Show wherever you get your shows. Just hit the subscribe button. It's free. If you want to get my weekly email newsletter, you can sign up over at bradlisty.substack.com. It's free. If you want to join the Other People Patreon community, I would love it if you did that over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. If you have a couple of minutes and you want to do me a quick favor, please give this show a rating wherever you listen. Sometimes you can write a review. So maybe write a review, preferably a good one, preferably a glowing review. If you want to get an Other People t-shirt or sign up for the Other People book club, my book club, just visit the show's official website, otherppl.com. All right, so coming up on Sunday, my guest will be Lydia Millett. She has a new book out called We Loved It All, A Memory of Life. It is a very unique book, an unconventional memoir of a kind. It is available from W.W. Norton and Company. I am so pleased to be welcoming Lydia Millett back onto this show. We had a very enlightening conversation. You don't want to miss it. Stay tuned.